pretty good venue. It's nice to be somewhere even older and shabbier than I am. Um, OK, so phone hacking. Uh, so I've been a journalist for a very long time, about 40 years. You start all sorts of stories. You don't quite know where they're going to go. This one started as nothing, and yet it's turned out to be the most destructive force I've ever laid my hands on. So the end result of it, you may know, is we had the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police resigned. The assistant commissioner, who was due to take his place, a deeply ambitious man called John Yates, he resigned. The chair of the Press Complaints Commission, she resigned. The News of the World closed. The Leveson Inquiry was set up. There was a massive war about the freedom of the press, all from Prince William's knee in December 2005. Prince William was doing something royal and robust and hurt the royal knee. And he phoned into his private office to say, the knee hurts, I think I need to see a doctor. And unknown to all those in the palace, the royal editor of the News of the World was in the habit of dialing in and listening to voicemail messages that came from Prince William's staff. So he heard this message. And the way that News of the World used to run things with intercepting voicemail was they understood that it was dodgy and illegal to do this. So they would disguise the information, deliberately get it a bit wrong, so that it wasn't 100% obvious where it had come from. So the royal editor, Clive Goodman, wrote a story in the News of the World saying, Prince William's hurt his knee, he's had to go and see the doctor. But in fact, the knee, being royal and therefore unusually robust, recovered on its own without medical assistance. And so the story was wrong, so wrong that the palace suspected and guessed where Clive Goodman had got it. So in come the police. Now, you begin to see why the story becomes so destructive when you, when you look at two things. First of all, when the police started to investigate, this is way back then in December 05, January 06, they put some effort into it and they came up to the surface with a trial. And in the trial, they accused two people. That's Clive Goodman, the royal editor, and the private investigator, who you may have heard of, Glenn Malcair, who, had, who was helping him to do these dodgy things. So two guilty people. And they said the total number of victims of this crime is eight. OK, if you fast forward, the police finally being forced by The Guardian and others to do a straight inquiry, say, well, we don't know about two perpetrators. They've so far arrested 210 people. And eight victims, so far with the voicemail hacking alone, they found 5,500. So we ask ourselves, why would Scotland Yard, the world's finest police force, go into an inquiry and come out saying this is the truth, when in fact that was the truth? And if you follow the police behavior through, it gets slightly more worrying, because our, a couple of years later we started running stories about it. And the very first story we wrote, this was July 2009, we said there were thousands of victims of this thing. The police didn't investigate. Da -di -da -di -da. And within about eight hours of publishing that story, the assistant commissioner, who eventually resigned, John Yates, stood up in front of the press, in front of Scotland Yard, and effectively said that the Guardian story was, to use a technical term, complete bollocks. And they were sitting on all this evidence, all this evidence of the 5,500 victims and the numerous other perpetrators. They were sitting on it. And over the next two years, as we kept publishing stories, the police kept giving false information to the public and to other newspapers and to Parliament to select committee hearings. The commissioner himself came along to see my editor and said, stop running these stories. They're all false. This is while they are sitting on the evidence that shows that the stories were true. So what was going on there? This is where you begin to get into why the story is so destructive. It isn't about journalists behaving badly. It's about power and the abuse of power, and in particular, the abuse that's perpetrated by one enormously powerful man, arguably the most powerful man in the world, Mr. M Murdoch, brackets, Rupert. And if you look back at the police, it's interesting to see how this, this, um, this power operates. It's primarily about fear. This is a newspaper proprietor, clearly. He runs four newspapers and the Sky News Channel. And he creates a fear. And it's interesting, this, because you and I are not scared of him. He, he, he's not coming after us. But the most powerful people in the country, the power elite, are very frightened of Rupert Murdoch in two different ways. First of all, he creates an individual fear that his newspapers may come after one of them and expose their private lives in some ghastly way, probably their sex lives. And that will be painful and humiliating and disastrous, reputationally lethal. So, uh, for example, there's an American guy, a journalist called Michael Wolfe, who wrote a biography of Rupert Murdoch, 
and he uncovered a few things that Murdoch didn't like. And before he published the book, he had a warning phone call from one of the Godfather's conciliary saying, we don't like the book, you know, we don't think we can support it. And Michael said to the guy, you don't think you could support it. Could that be bad? And the guy said, yeah, it could be. So the book comes out and they go after his sex life. They expose the fact in the New York Post, Murdoch's newspaper, that Michael was having an affair. And they ran it day after day after day. And because he was Jewish, they ran an anti-Semitic cartoon as well. This incredibly destructive force. So people in the power elite fear that happening to them. <clears throat> and in addition, they, they have a sort of organizational fear that if those newspapers choose to go after your organization, whether it's a company or a trade union or Neil Kinnock's Labour Party, they can completely destabilize it so that every day becomes a crisis. Whatever you were planning is chucked out of the window. And the, the, the key thing about this fear is that once it's established, it doesn't have to be repeated. To put it in a more concrete way, it's like the way a playground bully operates. The bully beats up two or three kids, and all the other kids in the playground get the message. They'll start tiptoeing around the bully and trying to placate him. So if you look at what happened with the police, as far as I know, nobody from Murdoch's network got onto the police and said, conceal all this stuff give false information about this stuff, try and stop The Guardian publishing. They didn't have to. They've got the message. There's fear out there. And so they'll take, their, their own, they'll take the, the initiative themselves to, to placate him. Okay, now where this becomes more important and where the power spreads is that the same thing happens in government. So if you look at... If you're, if you're running a huge corporation like Rupert Murdoch is, one of the things that you most dislike is regulation. So regulation might sound boring, but actually that's where the democratic pulse, what we guys think, <laughs> emergency, that's where the democratic pulse creates a kind of boundary and says to the corporation, that far and no further. You can't create a monopoly and take over the market. You can't run a business without having health and safety regulations. You have to allow trade unions to be represented. You have to pay the minimum wage. All those regulations. So a guy like Murdoch doesn't like them. So because he's created this fear, because therefore governments want to placate him, they will go out of their way to find ways to help him through the regulation. So this, the, he, he arrived in this country in the late 60s when he bought the News of the World and then The Sun. 10 or 11 years later, having made a lot of money, he made a lot of money by taking them down market and breaking a different set of boundaries. You, you know the New York Times, their slogan is, proudly, we print all the news that's fit to print. Well, the joke about Murdoch is he prints all the nudes that are fit to print. By banging into sex in a big, big way, lots of naked women, he pushed up his circulation. And he decided then to buy the Times and the Sunday Times. There was a regulation in the way. This would be creating something too much like a monopoly in Fleet Street. So what was then called the Monopolies and Mergers Commission flashed up a red light. So by that time, he was a, a, a kingmaker, somebody who was influencing the outcome of elections. And Mrs. Thatcher had been elected in 1979 with his assistance, so, so she helped him to get over the regulatory barrier. And together they colluded to pretend that these newspapers, the Times and the Sunday Times, were going bust because if the newspapers were bust, then the Monopolies and Mergers Commission wouldn't intervene. So on that fictional basis, Thatcher's government waved that through, and he was allowed to take over four newspapers and exert even more power over the system. So a few years came by, and he launched his Sky satellite television network. And you may remember back there, I can't remember which year it was, it actually did terribly badly. It was hemorrhaging millions of pounds a month. And there was a competitor called British Satellite Broadcasting, BSB, which had those square aerials, you remember? And the two of them were both suffering equally. And so Murdoch said, OK, I'll take over the opposition, then we'll have some sort of monopoly, I can do better. Once again, he ran into the regulations, that wasn't going to be allowed. And in those days, there was a television regulator called the Independent Broadcasting Authority, the IBA. And Mrs. Thatcher's government had decided it needed to be replaced with a new one called the ITC. And it so happened that there was a five-day gap when the old IBA was killed off before the new ITC was created. And guess what happened in the five-day gap? Yes, Rupert, come through here, create a monopoly. Shh, nobody's looking. So that's how government does it. And that's how he accumulates more and more power. And if you watch this thing unfold, so since, since he helped Mrs. Thatcher to get elected in 1979, 
No government in this country has ever been elected without Rupert Murdoch's support. And you stand back and you, you remember that quaint little idea that the Greeks came up with. You've probably forgotten it. It was this thing they called democracy. The idea was you have one man or woman and one vote and then we all create these governments and they do what we want, Tsk, gone. One media mogul, he's in there. So you look at really big decisions, like invading Iraq, for example. You can see Murdoch, not just Murdoch's newspapers, but Murdoch as an individual, leaning in on Tony Blair, having a really significant influence on that decision. Or the business about whether or not we should have joined the European currency, set aside whether or not it would have been a good idea. The fact that we didn't has an enormous amount to do with an, a man who's an Australian by birth, who's adopted American citizenship, but who thinks it's okay to gatecrash our political decisions and decide whether or not we should join a different currency. That's him at work. It, it reaches a level of absurdity as well. Uh, years back, when Rebecca Brooks, as she is now, was still Rebecca Wade, and she was editing The Sun, she came up with her new boyfriend, Charlie, to whom she's now married. And Charlie, you may know, is a racehorse trainer. So Rebecca moves as, as kind of Rupert Murdoch's representative on earth in very powerful circles. And the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, discovers that the powerful Rebecca has married a racehorse trainer. So he instructed officials to consider the possibility of cancelling the racehorse levy which is the tax on the racing industry. Not because it was good for the economy or that there was any necessary pressure to do it, but simply to please Rebecca, or at least to please Rebecca's boyfriend. It's reached a point of absurdity when you get to that kind of level. Okay, so if you stand back and look at this, do you see that the destructive power of the story reflects the, the, the power of the man? And because his power runs everywhere, once you start exposing what he's up to, the impact goes everywhere. Um, so we've been destructive, that's definitely true. Uh, however, it would be a mistake to mislead you into thinking that we have changed very much. So we've probably stopped crime being committed by national newspapers. I would think the level of that has fallen to zero. But give it a chance and it'll come back up. There, there was a point a few years ago when it looked as though we might manage to set up a new regulator for the press, so that if any of you have your lives turned over by these newspapers invading your privacy or inventing falsehoods about you, you would have a reasonable chance of getting things put right without having to spend hundreds of thousands of pounds going to court. And, and you remember the Leveson inquiry and his report. I, I thought his report was extremely clever and potentially very helpful, but it was subjected to the same kind of aggressive falsehood and distortion which ironically made his report necessary in the first place. And so it's been sidelined, and instead we have this sham new regulator which has been set up by the bad guys. It, you, know, you know this thing is called IPSO, the Independent Press Standards Organization. The first letter of that is particularly dishonest. This is not independent. It remains vulnerable to the influence of the nastiest people in Fleet Street. People like Paul Dacre from the Daily Mail, not somebody you want in your home. Richard Desmond from the Daily Express, really not somebody you want on the planet. And what's, <laughs> what's even worse about IPSO is that it's, it's as vulnerable to the influence of these horrible people as the old Press Complaints Commission was, but it has much more power. It can now investigate stories. It can levy huge fines. If those buggers had been in place when we were trying to expose the phone hacking scandal, given that lots of those newspapers were also committing similar crimes, they would have come in and investigated us and stopped it. So, so insofar as you hear newspapers or public opinion reflecting some sort of support for Ipso and hostility to Leveson, my strong advice would be don't believe a word of it. These are people who are deeply self-serving and not to be trusted. So we haven't achieved that, and beyond that, you look at the distribution of power, it's the same old story. So we have an election coming up in six or seven months' time. You, uh, in an ideal world, we would have stopped the whole idea that Rupert Murdoch could trample around Downing Street telling people what to do. Of course we haven't. And you will see, I fear, his newspapers throwing their weight around in a traditional way, deciding who our government should be, and you will see the politicians genuflecting and trying to placate him. It's a sad thing. So did, you, did you see a couple of weeks ago, Rupert had a meeting with Nigel Farage from, from UKIP. Why? What's it to do with him, this Australian who's become an American? He's playing the same old game again. Nothing's really changed. And that's because of a, of a bigger thing. Somebody's just flashed at me three minutes. I just want to tell you something. This is one of the very few things I have ever written that didn't make it into The Guardian. And it's about the underlying thing I'm talking about here. Just to, to explain 
I talked at a public meeting last night, this kind of crap I'm talking about now, and it was a really interesting meeting. It was a very, very politicized audience. And people were really politically alert and educated and articulate when they asked questions and make statements. And they were almost all my kind of age. Because something's happened in the last two or three decades, really since Mrs. Thatcher took power, which is that politics have been swept out of the center of public debate. So that people used to say when I was younger, I'm working class or I'm a trade unionist. Now they say, well, I'm a consumer. And instead of thinking, how can we make the world a better place? How when I was at university, there were really intelligent people who thought there would be a revolution in this country. Now people are just saving for a holiday. And in the, in the heart of that, we've become like fish who don't notice that they're in water because they accept things without noticing them. So we live in this very, very strange system, capitalism. And when I was younger, that was a huge subject for debate because a huge number of people in this country thought we could probably get rid of it and have a better system. And we failed. But it ceased even to be noticed. Do you see, like the fish in water. And so I, I did a book years ago about falsehood and distortion in the media. And I did a silly little test where I searched through a database of Fleet Street stories over the previous 10 years and said, let's count the number of times we've referred to capitalism and count the number of times we've referred to crap. And we were talking crap far more than we were talking about capitalism. It had ceased even to be noticed. OK, so I wrote this, this thing for The Guardian that didn't get printed. This is the parable of the eighth day. The idea is that God has spent seven days creating the world in the way that you will have heard of. And he's sitting in his study, probably with his feet on the desk, a little music playing, maybe James Taylor, cigar. And he's feeling pretty good. He's created an entire planet, the fish, the fowl, the humans, and all the rest of them. And some angels come in. Now, if you visualize this, these are not the guys with the white sheets and the big wings. These angels are wearing extremely expensive dark suits, white silk shirts, and probably red braces. And they say, God, uh, what are you doing about the economy? I mean, you've got all this wealth out there in the world, but you've got to find ways to to turn it into goods and distribute it to people. That's what we call an economy. He says, God, God says, that's no problem. Uh, we, 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 uh, the idea is that all of the humans on the planet will collectively own all of the commercial wealth, and it will be distributed according to local communities who will elect democratic assemblies, and they'll decide how it should be used. And we'll use that famous maxim, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. And the lead angel said, oh my God, which was appropriate. You're a Marxist. And God said, of course. What else do you expect? So they tied his hands behind his back. They tied his feet together. They shoved the Bible in his mouth, gagged him, and hurled him into the infinite darkness of outer space, which is why he's never been seen again. <laughs> and then they created a completely different system to the one he'd planned, where they said, well, take all the commercial wealth of this new planet, the capital, and we'll put it in the hands of a tiny minority of people. And then to all the other people, we'll say, well, you can have a little slice of that if you can persuade them to employ you. And they can decide how much of it they give you in, in wages. And, and that's it. Isn't that a great system? And that's what has happened. My point is, it's rather a sad thing that The Guardian didn't publish this story, but the, it, it did fail the first test of journalism. That it, I, I admit it wasn't strictly true. <laughs> but the point of it was, the point I was trying to get across is that if you, if you, if you first of all, if you were designing the world, you would never, ever produce capitalism. It's obviously absurd. It's obviously wrong. It's obviously unjust. It's obviously unstable. And yet we have it. And it's kind of self-perpetuating, self-embedding, that when you look at Rupert Murdoch's power, you're looking at the power of the supreme capitalist. And the more power he has, the more he is able to embed his power. Because he erodes democracy, he, he erodes the ability of our governments to express what we want and to do what we want. And that's why the phone hacking story is so destructive and so powerful in its funny little way. And that was why I wanted to talk to you. Okay, thank you.